So we are in a message series right now on the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been going about four weeks. And so for those of you who are just joining us, just a couple of refreshers. One is the Sermon on the Mount is by far Jesus' most famous message. Uh, it's, there's pieces of it that even if you've never read the Bible, you've never heard Sermon on the Mount talked about, you've heard pieces of the Sermon on the Mount. The golden rule comes from the Sermon on the Mount. So does the phrase, turn the other cheek. And there's a number of other things that as we go through it, you might, I've heard that somewhere before. Things that have actually shaped society for the last 2,000 years came out of this message that Jesus gave. And the first piece to the Sermon on the Mount is called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes just means supreme blessing. And it's when in the phrase, the word that's used to translate to this blessing that Jesus says over and over again, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, that word blessing, it's talking about something that can probably best be translated as happiness, internal happiness, joy that fills you up. And so, you know, typically we need to, we need to figure out, man, I, I just, I'm down a lot. I need to find a way to get happier, have a happy life. There's books, piles and piles of books that are written about how to find happiness in life. And uh, we don't often think, let's go to, to what Jesus said about how to find this. Because I think he's, he's probably, you know, as far as you, if you were to list out the wisest people around, Jesus should be on the top. And so let's see what he has to say. Now, the one surprising thing, just to remind us, on this list are things you wouldn't expect. Jesus lists types of people, people that are in certain situations that from the surface on, on appearance, you might think unblessed. They're, they're far from it. They have not achieved happiness or blessing in their life. But as we've walked through these Beatitudes, Jesus has started to give us a different perspective. And the last thing I want to remind you of is this perspective comes from a new heart. And Jesus used this weird phrase. He said, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, one must be born again. It's a weird phrase to think about, but it's kind of like, uh, well, when he said it, he's talking about a spiritual birth. He wants to give us new hearts. And it's sort of like a caterpillar that transitions to a butterfly, right? It, it starts out looking up at the world, eating leaves, walking around pretty slow, and then something amazing happens, and now it's got this new life perspective. This, it's looking down on the earth. It's actually drinking the nectar out of flowers, just a whole new way of living a new perspective on life. And that's what Jesus is trying to do with these Beatitudes. He's flipping things upside down, giving us new perspectives, a new way to understand life from the kingdom perspective, the kingdom that he's bringing and ushering in with his ministry. So we're wrapping up the Beatitudes today, and I wanted to bring everybody to the same page here. So I'm going to go ahead and read um, the, the next three verses in these Beatitudes as he takes these to a close. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So those, those things that he lists... And his blessed are those who, they don't, they don't make sense on the surface. You read it like, really? That doesn't sound like a blessing to me. So we're going to walk through this and see what this really means. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord's help, and we're going to jump in. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this morning, the beautiful weather outside. Um, God, I thank you that, that you are alone worthy, and you are uh, the, the biggest and the strongest. Nothing is too hard for you. And you are great. And God, I pray that this morning you would um, speak to us, help us to understand your word, what you meant by it. Help us to begin to gain this new perspective that you're trying to give us. I ask for your help as I speak. Help me to speak um, clearly and in truth. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we, as we begin to talk about these, these two more blessings, he's talking about those who are persecuted, reviled, insulted, all these Really horrible things, things we try our best to avoid. One thing to remember is that through his list of blessings, right, he said, blessed are those who mourn. 
He's not suggesting that we go and become lifetime mourners. Right? These are not things that he's saying, hey, if you want to earn my blessing, go and do this. But he's acknowledging, hey, even in this state of life, even when this is going on around you, because you are mine, because you are kingdom people, you are blessed. So that's, that's the, the attitude to come at it with. And so when Jesus addresses these persecution things, he's not saying, hey, go seek out persecution if you want to be blessed. That's not what he's aiming at. But he knows, he's, he's telling them, if you're going to follow me, you're going to experience this. Persecution will come. You're going to be persecuted for trying to stick up for what's right. He said, for righteousness' sake. You'll be persecuted for just being loyal to me. And we know from what happened in the years to come from Jesus' ministry that they persecuted him. They killed him. So why would we expect anything less? We're going to stick with him and be loyal to him. So we're going to dig into that first. So first, let's look at that, that first verse we just read. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So how does that happen? When does that happen? When do we have to stick up for what's right? Now, I've been fortunate since I've been in, an, in the adult world um, most people around me have, have been people who, they're not overtly uh, doing evil all the time. You know, they're, they're, I've been around a lot of good people. I've had a lot of uh, great coworkers in various companies I've worked for. So I've not had to experience too much of the, the group I'm running with trying to do all kinds of things. I'm having to constantly say, stop! Some of you might be in those situations, though. What I do know, and I'm speaking to you kids for a minute, those older kids, Kids can be kind of ruthless sometimes. I know when I was a kid, I, I kind of was. I also had some friends and enemies. And we could be mean to each other. You get into school and it just becomes kind of normal to cut, cut, cut each other down. And this, is, this verse can be speaking to you, even you kids. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So I've seen it happen where, where kids just start beating up on each other, either with their mouths or with their actions. And it's scary to stand up and be like, hey, let's not do this. Let's stop. That's not right. Because what happens? You can lose some of the cool kid points. And that's scary. But this is saying to even you kids who, who choose to follow Jesus and to do what's right, to stick up for what's right. And I pray this for my kids, that they would be strong and courageous to do what's right, even when it's hard. Because when you get in this moment, what it's saying is, hey, you know what? You know who really hands out the cool kid points? God does. You're in his kingdom before any other club or school group or sports team. Doesn't matter. You're in his club. He hands out the cool kid points. Blessed are you when you stand up for what's, you're persecuted for standing up for what's right. It applies to kids, to all of you, but adults too. And even adults can be swayed into to wanting the cool kid points. I know I can. Wanting, wanting the status, wanting to look cool before your coworkers, your neighbors, your peers, whatever it may be. And it's tough to just stand up for what's right. So sometimes that happens in informal groups, like I've mentioned, but it also happens in organizations like companies. We call this person the whistleblower. And there are laws to protect the whistleblower, right? They, they're, they're not supposed to, to retaliate on whistleblowers. And I, I've been in HR. I know that world. But there is no law that can protect against any kind of, of human interaction, right? There, there are still things that, that come back on you for standing up for what's right. And God is saying to us here, hey, even if that happens, your, your provision, the thing you might be scared of most is losing your job for standing up for what's right. Guess where your provision comes from? The hand of God, if you're in his kingdom. Your, your cool kid points come from him. And so if you go through that process, I'm, don't go seeking it out. But it, Jesus is speaking to these people saying, hey, when this happens, when you stand up for what's right, and you experience persecution on account of that, you're blessed. Because the kingdom of heaven is yours. That's, that's pretty huge. 
We'll, we'll be taken care of no matter what. We're going to move into this next verse, and, and there's some, some shifts here when Jesus moves to this next verse. He, he breaks some patterns that he established in the first verses, uh, where typically he was saying, blessed are those, right? Blessed are those. Blessed are those when. Uh, in this one, he gets a little more direct. And, and we know from the context around the Sermon on the Mount, he's just been doing this incredible healing spree. He's been healing people, and there's crowds and the nearest him are his students, his newly minted disciples. And so you can imagine him shifting from talking to the crowd, blessed are those when, blessed are those when, to blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. See, you can imagine these, these disciples that are hanging around Jesus, and he drops to this you phrase. And it's, they probably would have been, oh, you, is something coming? Something coming that you're, you haven't told us yet? Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, the audience didn't know it, but what preceded that? The, the following things over the next two or three years in Jesus' ministry would have been hard. People were persecuting them. They were chasing them and hunting them. Jesus had to leave places because they were trying to stone him. That just happened. And so Jesus, in one way, was, was giving them a heads up. It's like, hey, when this happens, I want to prepare you for it. People are going to revile you. That means insult. We don't use that word these days, revile. But when people insult you, when people persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely, now we do need to remember this caveat, he says, on my account. So if you're, you're doing evil things that warrant insulting or evil things that warrant uh, people attacking you or, or, you know, trying to stop you from robbing the bank, um, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, but no, when, you, when you're being persecuted for my account, on my account, because you claim the name of Jesus and what he stood for, blessed are you. And there's a couple things I want to point out here. One is back in, that, in those days, who was doing the persecuting? You know, Jesus was warning them. He was telling them ahead of time, hey, you're going to experience this. And when it happens, blessed are you. But who is doing the persecuting? And it's, it's a little bit surprising. It was the people who were supposed to be Jesus' welcoming committee. It was the, the leaders of the religious institution of the day, the Jews, who were supposed to be God's chosen people, to know he was coming, he was sending his son, and to be his welcoming committee. It was those people, the leaders of those people, who were reviling, persecuting, and attacking Jesus, and then his followers. These people in their society held the most moral pull, the influence. They were the influencers. They could set new rules and new laws for their religious organization, and it was, it was concrete. They held that kind of power, and they didn't want to lose that power. And so they were offended when Jesus comes and he's saying, hey, I'm bringing in something new. So that's, that's a little bit surprising that it was supposed to be his welcoming committee that turned on him and began doing the persecuting. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop with killing Jesus, because they did comes the train. I wish I had a great question to let you marinate on for a moment. Um, so beyond this moment, oh, no. Probably had to close that door back there. Um, so it didn't stop, though. It didn't stop with Jesus and his immediate disciples. It continued. Throughout history, persecution has come upon Christ followers. That's just been a normal thing. In various nations across the globe, it's just happened. Yet Jesus is still saying for those people right around him, for the people coming after him, for us today, rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Here, here's the main message I want to communicate here through these two verses. As citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we don't need to fear persecution, insult, 
or evil attacks being done on the account of Jesus and on account of, of living for his ways. Because instead, we can rejoice and we can embrace those things actually as a badge of honor. You see, that he says, for so the prophets were killed and done to. These things happened to the prophets. They, those are like their giants, their spiritual giants in their, in their religion because they, they, they followed the Old Testament very closely. These old prophets, they were spiritual giants and they had been murdered. And so Jesus is saying, hey, it's a badge of honor. When people do this, you can, yes, I just got my, my medal of honor kind of thing for, for following Jesus. And great is your reward in heaven. So, you see, that, that kind of thing, to actually embrace that, it requires a different perspective. It requires one that actually believes in real life that it doesn't all end when we die here. It, it's not all over when this life ends. In order to believe and to actually live out what Jesus is saying here, we actually have to believe He is real and what He is saying about His eternal heavenly kingdom is legit. Is it real? If you grasp that, and if you, if you begin to live that, then yes, you can do this. You can, can get a hold of this statement he's making about rejoicing and being glad. That means we can actually be happy going through anything, any kind of challenge and situation, not, not just persecution. We've gone through this other list of beatitudes, and they include things like mourning, People who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness because they recognize they lack it. So how does this apply to us today? Like, does this stuff actually happen, the persecution stuff? Does it happen here? You know, there, there's obviously plenty of places in the world, you, you may have heard about it, but there's, there's places in the world where you can just be killed for being a Christian. If they find out you are a believer of Jesus Christ, they will kill you. There are other places where claiming Christ means not accepting their political overarching agenda. And so if you do claim Christ and you renounce what they're saying, you, you lose all kinds of job opportunities, any kind of, of economic ability, you lose it. And there's places where you lose your spouse, you lose your parents, you lose your kids, because of choosing to follow Jesus. The cost is high in many places in the world. But what about here? You know, think, things have been moving and shifting over the years. Our society has, is and has been moving further and further away from God and from His Word as a basis for what is true and right. There was a time when, when that was sort of the, the moral foundation had to do with what the Bible says is good and what the Bible says is not. But that's, that's sort of been broken. And so as that happens, we now have a moving target. What, what is righteous, what is good, is no longer determined by something concrete. It's determined by, think about in Jesus' day, the people who had the moral pull and the influence. That's where right comes from. And so it can happen here. And I want to give a few examples of where that occurs. You know, in many workplaces, in many schools, uh, there, there's becoming a rapid requirement that employees, students, teachers, parents embrace the organizational values that they hold. And but what about when that doesn't jive with the Bible? When we have two masters, an employer and a Jesus. Who do we follow? You know, I, I worked at a company once, and by a well-meaning boss, he told me, I would suggest that you check your Christian morals at the door when you walk in, because they just don't fit here. Well-meaning boss, he's trying to help me out <laughs> in a very large organization. But it's, it's becoming more and more real. So how do we respond to these things? And think back on the, the cool kid points, right? But now there's more at stake. There's, there's feeding my family. There's remaining in good standing with the people around me, with my friends. There's things that we have to make real choices on, on what are we going to stand up for and what are we going to let slide. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying 
We need to go and pick fights. We need to become the judge of all the people around us. They must follow the Bible. The thing is, Jesus is rescuing people out of one kingdom and bringing them into the next, into the heavenly kingdom, right? So there's no reason to expect the world, the kingdom that actually is under the sway of the devil, to do the things Jesus did. There's just not going to happen. But when it comes to us, I'm just like, hey, I have to follow some kind of rule. I've got to follow yours or Jesus's. Which one am I going to pick? That's where it gets real. And then you have this question to face. Is, is the stuff that I believe, the stuff that I, I, I've heard Jesus has said, I think he said maybe, is that actually going to play out in my life? Am I going to put my toe over the line where I, don't, I no longer can trust in my skills and ability and my ability to talk my way around this thing, I've actually just got to trust in this God and trust he's going to make it work out. And there's a story that most of you kids have probably heard about a guy named Daniel. And there was a, a den that involved some animals. What were the animals? Yeah, Rick, go just shout it out. Lions! Daniel in the lion's den. And he got put in this position. There were some guys trying to get Daniel out of the picture because he was about to be put in a position over them. And they went to their king and said, hey, King Darius, let's make a law that says for 30 days, everybody in this country has to only pray to you. They can't pray to any other God or any other person. And he, he, he kind of fell for it. He did it. He said, yes, he stamps it with a law that cannot be repealed. Daniel gets wind of it. And he could have, like, hidden somewhere and just prayed in secret, but he doesn't. Daniel goes straight to his house, gets in front of a window that's wide open and faces the, the, the Jerusalem, and he just starts praying, and he continues exactly what he's been doing. Three, days, uh, three times a day, he's praying to the God of the heavens, the God of the Israel, Israelites. And, of, of course, the guys say, yes, he bit, he took it. And they go to Darius, and he was actually quite distraught. He liked Daniel. He, that's why he was about to promote him over the whole kingdom. And, but he couldn't repeal the law. So Daniel does what is right. He stands up for his God and what he knows to be right, and he gets thrown in the lion's den. And Darius, just sleepless night, he's like, I, I hope, he says, I hope your God, who you pray to and are faithful to, can save you. And morning comes, and King Darius walks out to the den and opens the, the hatch. You still alive, buddy? I'm here. My God has saved me. They kept their mouths shut. He, they pull him out, not a wound on him. His God came through for him. We have to decide when we're walking through these choices, is my God real? Or is he just fancy talk in, in this thick, complicated book? I think beginning, beginning to move toward following Jesus like this, to where you can read this passage and actually think, okay, I'm going to rejoice and be glad, even in the midst, in the face of insults and evil things happening to me. It begins with adopting this eternal perspective. It's one that, that believes, hey, God is not going to rip me off. No matter what happens to me in this life, he's still got me in his hands. He can take care of me no matter what. And even if I lose my life, he's still going to take care of every, all of my responsibilities, my kids, my family. He's going to take care of all of that because he loves them even more than I do. And then there's these rewards and this eternity in heaven afterward. That's this, this message that Jesus is giving here in these last two Beatitudes. So I want to summarize, before we move away from the Beatitudes completely, I want to summarize some of the things that we've pulled out of these, these verses in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, one of the things that Jesus says a few times in his ministry is that in my kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And it, it's very clearly laid out in these Beatitudes because he's giving a list of lasts. He's giving people who are He's listing poor in spirit people, people who have nothing to offer spiritually. He's listing them as blessed. He's listing those who are mourning as blessed, those who 
have no righteousness of their own. They, they hunger and thirst for it. He's listing them as blessed. How does this apply today, though? Like, who's last today? There, there's sort of a silly side and a serious side to this. You know, in our, in our society, to be anything but trim, like physically shaped, trim, quick-witted, beautiful, well-dressed, anything outside of those, you're starting to slide down this slope toward lastedness. That's not a word. And it scares us. Like it's, it's something we think about. You get up and you look in the mirror and you're like, who are you comparing yourself against? There's, there's, tip, there's probably somebody. Who will that person, that, that fuzzy person out there think? What will they think when they look at me today, when I, I look at myself? Or do we judge ourselves based upon these things, these characteristics of firsts, if you want to be firsts in our society, whatever it may be. And it depends on what group you hang around with. Like some groups, you got to have a Ferrari to be in the middle. For some other groups, a Camry will do just fine. You know, it depends on who you hang around. But Jesus is saying, hey, in, in this world, there's this ranking system, these values, these things you got to have to be first. And in my kingdom, they're at the bottom of the list. Actually, those people that are last in your society, when they come to me, they're up here. Your value is not based upon the things that you have or the, the things that you know, the degree that you have. It's based upon whose you are. God looks at his people, his children, and his kingdom. They're his, and he's a king. What's the child of a king called? They're royalty. God looks at us with that kind of value so we need to not buy into this first this category categorization and the way that we tend to value ourselves. We don't even catch ourselves. Like we just we just live in it. It's kind of like a soup. You just bake in it and you don't bake soups. You, you just kind of exist in it and it informs how you think about yourself. And Jesus is flipping that whole thing on the head with his beatitudes. So I want to give you a couple of next steps. If you've never decided that, you know what, Jesus, he's real. He is the Son of God. He is Lord. He did die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, and then he came back to life. If you've never actually just confessed that and said, Lord, I need you. I need your, sa your salvation. I need your forgiveness. I'd encourage you to do that because he actually offers it to everyone. No matter where you, whatever you rank, it doesn't matter. He wants to offer that freely to anyone who will follow him. So I'd encourage you to do that. If you have, if maybe you, you do follow Christ, maybe you've been doing it for just a few months or maybe for years, we still forget. We're just in our soup, right? We, we start getting swayed by the cool kid points in whatever group we're with. And sometimes we just, it's impossible to keep up with that. We start feeling down. We get to the end of the day. It's like, I don't know why. I just, I'm just a terrible person. And if you get to that point, you need the same message that everybody else does. It's this gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus came to speak and to say, the good news for all mankind. Just remind yourself of the same message, that before God, you are highly valued. He actually, he loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you. Remember that. Preach it to yourself. And if you need someone to remind you, come and talk to me. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask Aaron to come back up and lead us in one last song. Lord, Father, I just thank you that you have the ultimate perspective. I thank you for being a good, kind, loving king. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to show us who you are, and to save us so that we could get to know you. God, I pray for, for those here who are still searching you out, trying to figure out who you are. God, please speak to them directly. Meet them where they're at. Help them to know exactly what that next step is you want them to take. Give them clarity on that, Lord. And for the others who, who know you already, God, would you just give us all a, re a refreshed sense of, of who you are and who we are in light of who you are. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I just got a couple of quick announcements for us. And...
I'm going to look at the look at the slides here to remind me what they are. There's a, a connections card. You all have these in your worship folder. Um, there, and this is how we keep in touch with you. So if you just drop your name and your email address, uh, we send out an email so you know where we're going to be. Uh, every once in a while, we meet at the park. So we'll let you know that via email when we're going to be there. And then also we have a number of events that are coming up, and we can let you know about those and how to get involved with those as well. Um, so fill out that connection card so we can do that. The first event is we have a Mother's Day. Oh, what, which one are we looking at? May 23rd. Uh, one month from now, about three weeks, we're going to do another park service. And so we're actually going to do a baptism on that day out at the park. We're not using the river, okay? I'm, not a, I'm just afraid to do that. I don't want to lose you. So <laughs> we're going to have a, like a, a trough kind of thing that's going to be filled up with clean water. And it, it probably will even be heated. So um, if you are interested in getting baptized... Uh, just let me know. We, we have some, I want to have a chat with you and talk about what it means in the Bible to be baptized. Uh, I'd love to talk with you about that. And then, uh, so that's on the 23rd of May. Um, and then we also have a Mother's Day brunch coming up on Saturday. That's 10 to noon. And we'll, it'll happen right here. So we're going to have a lot of fun stuff for the moms. There will be um, some rolls and pastries coming from Anita's Bakery. And then also there will be a build-your-own-succulent design thing. I wish I could describe it as well as the ladies who are helping plan this. Um, it'll be fun. There is child care if you need it. So if, if you don't have an op- another option, you can actually bring kids. Um, so we do need you to sign up so we know how much food uh, to have and then also how many kids to expect. So if you would please, um, you can either come tell me, hey, I'm coming. You could tell my wife, Hannah, that you're going. Or you can send us an email. Uh, and let us know that way. So we'd love to have you there. And then uh, one thing that I, before we get to that, one other thing, we're actually going to do what I hope to be our final construction project day on this space on Tuesday afternoon. Um, it, it looks pretty good in here. We're almost all the way done, but there's, some, there's a room over there for our bigger kids that's not done yet, and we finally got the materials for it. So Tuesday, from 4 p.m. to I don't know when, as long as you can hang around, We're going to be flooring and finishing up, hopefully, the rest of the space. So let me know if you'd like to come to that. Um, We'll also provide some food for whoever's there. And then lastly, um, we are launching a River Park running group. That'll be fun. And it's a running, walking, jogging, rolling, however you want to do it, um, group. And it's for anybody who wants to come. We'll meet here on Saturdays at 8 and then uh, have a little bit of a discussion time and then get moving at your own pace. So you can find somebody that goes at your pace and just stick with them and have a good time. So that's starting on Saturday, May 8th, May 15th, excuse me. All right, I'm done talking. Please stand as Aaron leads us in our last song.